This is the Amp Hour Podcast. Released December 20th, 2020. Episode 522. High Current Power Supplies with Frederick Kinsander. Welcome to the Amp Hour. I'm Chris Gamble of Contextual Electronics. And I'm Frederick Kinsander of uh, Kraft PowerCon. Welcome, Frederick. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing fine. Thank you. Nice to be on the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You were you actually wrote in uh, about this. I think you're actually one of our first guests from Sweden. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. Oh, uh, actually, Simone might be from Sweden. I don't remember where she's from originally, but she doesn't live in Sweden. Uh, I'm trying to think of other guests we've had maybe, but uh, yeah, maybe our first guest from Sweden. So Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I remember some episode with some guy with that Swedish-like name, but I don't think it was mm. from Sweden. Yeah. Mm, yeah. yeah. So so what is what is the electronics scene like in Sweden in general? The industry is quite uh, high-tech, I would say. Mm-hmm. I, uh, my first job was in, in lean shopping and the uh, I uh, worked at a company that did uh, like encryption stuff. It was quite oh, high end. Yeah. And we have uh, Saab, which does the fighter jets and uh, mm-hmm. yeah, like that. So that's quite. I think I think my former company is, has some headquarters there. I see a brown Bavaria or ABB. Yeah. I think that's part yeah, yeah. Swedish, part Swiss. So a- ABB is a big one. Which is like a weird, <laughs> a weird bedfellows. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> those, I guess those company or those countries both start with S. So <laughs> Yeah. Well, and and I mean, I mentioned ABB too because it's like uh, we did some high power stuff, but it seems like you're, I mean, you're also doing high power stuff. And so, tell us about your what you're currently working on. So I work at Kraft PowerCon where we make uh, what we call rectifiers. And uh, <laughs> yeah, as I mentioned uh, before the show, when I applied for a job here, they said like, okay, we make rectifier, and I was like, okay, that's four diodes. Uh, what's next? <laughs> no. So it's yeah. basically switch mode power supplies for uh, mm-hmm. high current and high voltage. Yeah, and and like give us give us a range. Like what what are some of the power power envelopes that you're working? Yeah, on? it's it's like the hundred to two hundred kilowatt uh, range for the big products. I think. Mm. Uh, we even have some it goes up to 700 kilowatts uh, wow. uh, that we make in India, those big things. And we, so we have different uh, sites. We have both in Sweden, we have mm-hmm. in India. We have, have some stuff going on in China and we have some sales office in the US and yeah, yeah. Different, different places. Yeah, I mean, it seems like really specialized equipment. So I would imagine that it's like where you need this kind of power, you're just people are seeking you out and they're like yeah i just have this one need to to do this sort of thing yeah and there's like different product areas so the the mm-hmm. high voltage stuff is used for uh, cleaning exhaust gases from uh, power plants mm-hmm. and the like mm-hmm. so you put like 100 kilovolts on metal plates and you attract uh, particles yep. and then you can like have big mechanical hammers that hammers on the plates and the particles fall down and gets collected mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's like a not like like a industrial process, like a it's like in yeah. a smokestack or something. Yeah, okay. so it's an, in the smokestack, and they, they can have different. Uh, it's called electrical precipitators, those kind okay. of filters. Yeah, versus like a, I guess another way of doing that would be like actually passing passing this particulates through like a filter medium, but then you'd have to switch that out. This actually allows it to be reused over and over yeah i I guess the flow is much better in this case (laughs) because you would restrict the flow very much if you had and then you you can't really maybe collect all the smallest particles that way yeah all right right so because there's a lot of emission controls going on and uh, i I actually know a guy that works like that he goes out and measure chimneys and ensure they follow the regulations Mm -hmm. yep yep yeah I, i knew someone who used to do that and he has to go he had to go and like inspect towers it was in Ohio, so like the towers weren't that tall, right? You no. know, there wasn't like a huge thing. But he would get regularly, like he'd be like climbing towers, and like all these birds that making nests up there, they'd come and just like swoop on them because they're like, "What are you doing to my home?" Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. So, but you just had yeah. to go check the filters. So, yeah, yeah, and and the, the products we make for that area, they they actually live on top of the power plants. So, oh wow, they, they are from like minus forty degrees Celsius to plus fifty degrees. So uh-huh. there's some harsh environment requirements. 
Yeah. What What about like, uh, I mean, I guess they'd have to run power up to that too. So they'd have to have like lightning arresting and, and similar kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, I guess so. I haven't been up there myself, but. Uh... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm more of a ground-based <laughs> creature myself. <laughs> no, but the, um, the power, the mains power is like to one rectifier can be 250 amps. So uh, free phase. Wow. So yeah. there are some big cables going up there, I guess. Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. And so is, is that the that's the the ones that you're working on or are you working on something else? No, I'm working more on the high current ones. So oh, yeah. that's uh like for um, electroplating, putting metal on stuff. Uh mm-hmm. so um surface treatment like that. So you mm-hmm. you dip stuff into a chemical bath and you put a lot of current on it. Yeah. And uh, what are, what kind of currents are we talking about here? Yeah, here here we talk about like one kiloamp to mm-hmm. 30, 40 kiloamps. <laughs> okay, uh, all right, that's, uh, that's some amps, yeah. So then uh, at the power envelope, so 30 kiloamps, and that would be what, in like the 50 volt range? Like what's the voltage then? On yeah, that? yeah, the voltage uh, voltage is, uh, yeah, for uh, the electroplating stuff, it's uh, 10 volts maybe. Mm-hmm. They, they go okay. up to 12, and we have some cases with 20 volts, yeah. Mm, okay. Um, and then, so like t- about the electroplating process too. So like what about what about the high current? Like why I guess I don't know how electroplating works in the first place. <laughs> but like uh so you're passing current through a liquid and then is it like you is the thing that you're trying to plate that acts as like an anode or a cathode? Is that Yeah, kind of exactly. Idea? You dip it down and it's one part is the anode and the other part is the cathode. You put mm-hmm. a lot of current in it and uh, I guess the metal that's in the solution that gets put on the thing that you want to plate. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And so it's just the high current is just for higher throughput or higher amounts of plating or whatever? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the bigger the area, I guess, of the object you're trying to plate, the more yeah. current you need and the faster you want it to go, the more current you need. And uh, it's also used for, like for PCB uh, uh, manufacturing, I know. Oh, cool. Because you put copper on the PCB, so uh-huh. the same, same kind of process. So this yeah. would be done at the like the uh, at the actual board house, or this would be done at a manufacturer that's making like like a prepreg that has like pre-populated with copper on it or something. Mm, it's at the board house uh, where they actually make the PCBs. Oh, okay. So, oh. and uh, the the simplest one is the DC, but uh, we also make uh, pulse products okay. because um, if you're gonna plate like a through hole in a, in a PCB uh, like a via. It's hard to get uh, the same amount of copper in the hole as you get on the surface of the board. Mm, yeah. Um, so the high the the aspect ratio, the the higher the aspect ratio goes, the harder it gets. Uh-huh. So it's like I was just reading they they see they will use a lot of pulse plating for new five G boards because mm-hmm. like the back planes are like usually thick boards, maybe four millimeter thick. And if you have a via that's like 0.25 millimeters, the aspect ratio is really high. Yeah. So they use something called reverse pulse plating. So maybe you go first positive pulse and then you go negative a couple of times higher than that. Mm-hmm. And uh, this product goes in the sub millisecond if you want to. So that's quite fascinating yeah. also. Yeah, that's that's great. And, and the same kind of power, power or current levels, huh? Yeah, that's yeah. That's like I think our product uh, says uh, one hundred amps to two thousand four hundred. So it can be kiloamps. So maybe you go mm-hmm. one hundred amp forward and then one kiloamp backwards, and you have a pulse that's uh, one millisecond or point five millisecond long. Yeah, I f- I feel like I would love to see like I would love to see like a science educator <laughs> do like an illustration of like how. How the ions are moving, like I, 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 I guess, like kind of, I kind of get an idea why a pulse would matter to get it down into like a high aspect ratio yeah. via, but I don't understand the actual like physics, like why a pulse versus like a sine wave, or you know, like you know, like that doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, for some reason, it's like I read a little bit about it, but it's like the, if if you do DC, the the most uh, ions will go to the um, the high current density areas, and you, okay, and you have high higher current density on the mm. top side and bottom side. You don't have so high current density in the hole uh. before you get copper down into it. So, and the pulse helps to get the copper down into the hole. Got it. Okay. So it's like, uh, 
instead of like slapping paint on the outside of you like painting a car yeah. you wouldn't use like a paintbrush you use like one of those mister you know like those uh the spray gun type of things instead and like yeah. you'd use a pulse at a time to get it like okay all right yeah i guess that makes it like like intuitively I, I guess that makes sense but like i just yeah it seems like there's physics at play that i just don't understand no no i think the closest i would have is like so i used to do when i used to do like dry etch mm. you know like it was always hard it was similar like hard to do really high aspect ratio like vias or etching you know through mm. holes yeah and you know we'd have these weird recipes for it but it would be it wasn't necessarily pulsed so much you know there's always like rf stuff happening you know weird 60 kilowatt yeah thingies <laughs> <laughs> i really didn't know what i was doing there let's be yeah. honest <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 but uh yeah that, that's interesting i mean do you, do you get to go and visit some of the places that the uh that you've you've uh, your stuff goes into uh, yeah we said one place that actually just a few kilometers from here where they were making uh, pcbs uh Kogra, cool. it's called mm-hmm. uh and uh, but they have some just uh, what I think it was just the DC products, so not the fancy okay. pulse. Although most of the pulse products uh, is in uh, like China. Okay, yeah, like super super advanced type of boards and mobile type things. Yeah, so like mm-hmm. that. Yeah, yeah. I guess I never I never really thought about that with like you know you can get like laser micro like I just we talked about last week on like with Bunny's uh, mm-hmm. Bunny Huang's post about the. Um, the laser microvias and on that board that he was making and it's like yeah okay i, I kind of get like the making of the board but then yeah you think you gotta you gotta plate everything too and that becomes really really tough yeah 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 mm. what uh what uh, what uh what elements outside of pcb plating are are these used in so you said uh uh, electroplating and the PCBs. Are there other other industries? Yeah, ballast water treatment is a really big one. So you okay. know, uh, big cargo ships they have some. When they have offloaded their cargo, they need ballast water in the tanks to stabilize uh-huh. the ship. Uh-huh. And, uh huh. And if you pick that water up somewhere, and then you go across the globe to some mm-hmm. other country, you don't yeah. want to let it out because you could bring marine life from one area to another one. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it actually became a legal requirement just some year or something ago. There's been a lot mm-hmm. of debate about it, but it finally became legal. So all, all ships must have it. So now it's a really big industry. And uh, yeah. uh, well, I was fascinating like a year ago to see our uh, volumes go from, go ba- basically go 10 times up. What we made in a year, oh. we suddenly made in a month. Holy moly. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 That's got to be some interesting requirements. So first off, I, I, I have, I remember like when I was like in school, it was like zebra mussels were like this like invasive species in the Great Lakes where I grew up. And so like, yeah. that was like a big thing. And, you know, these tankers would come in and they'd be dumping zebra mussels. And so like, that was like a, a thing that I learned about. And it was, yeah, it was basically that problem, you know, yeah. they would come in and do that. But the, the interesting thing I would think is marine isn't, don't marine electronics have like, 400 hertz like aren't they kind of like airplane electronics like weird like onboard uh generation capabilities and they have higher voltage so i think okay. the normal uh, free phase voltage is 440 volt okay so and they can go up to 480 and uh, then when you make a product for that voltage you should also go plus 10 percent so we test it up to 528 volt okay <laughs> yeah at the same time, we should also work at 400 volts so we can test it here in-house. Right. So yeah. it's put some requirements on the primary side of the of the rectifier to be able to cope with that range. Yeah. And, yeah, that's uh, that's that's pretty extreme, huh? It's. I mean, it's extreme even at 400 volts. Let's let's be honest. This is way outside the realm that I'm usually working yeah. at. So yeah. It's uh. So let's talk about like safety a little bit then. So how do you keep yourself safe when you're like in the lab and and working on this sort of stuff? Yeah, yeah, we we have like first of all, yeah, we have a safety manual that you should know about and follow. The more and uh, like you, you should know when you're working on a free face, and you should try to put some protection on it so you don't touch it by accident. And okay. also, we try so that's to, like covers or, or yeah, what, yeah, what are we put about put here? some plastic covers on it, and uh, and um, like the products are made relatively safe, even if you remove like the front panel. So they can be maybe IP44 with the front panel on. And even if you remove it, maybe it's IP21 or something. So you cannot accidentally touch things with high voltage. Oh, okay. I actually, I don't, I don't know. These, these are like, uh, I, whenever I hear IP, I always think of like waterproof standards, but these are like. Yeah, 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 yeah I'm not sure if it's IP21, but it's basically mm-hmm. you cannot 
get your finger into it in the okay. dangerous area. But if mm-hmm. you open it up so you can get your finger on that part, so you could put some plastic cover on it. Mm-hmm. And if you're doing some really, really dangerous, you can have one one of your colleagues standing at the emergency breaker. Yeah, so that's good. Yep. To pull that one if something happens. Do you do re- reflex testing for your, your coworkers? You're like, no, I have something. Like, hey, Bob, how, how are you feeling today? You got good, mm. fast reflexes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it can also be uh, when somebody's like about to do something and you make like a high-pitched sound and they think there's a spark, they will sometimes jump up <laughs> <laughs> if you want to yeah. mess with them. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, I try not to mess with people with high voltage around. Yeah, that's... that's uh... <laughs> no, no. No, but yeah. uh, so that that's the one side, and then you have the output. When it's like if you have a one power module with three hundred amps out, mm-hmm. you, you put it into a resistor, and that resistor usually starts glowing. Mm-hmm. So yeah, at least it will be orange. And I've been told to stop before it gets white. <laughs> okay, so like color temperature type yeah. stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So yeah, wow. it's good. It can it can get hot in the lab, yeah. I was gonna say Sweden is not a you know the winters here, and so you know it's helped to heat up the office. I'm sure you know like everybody's got space heaters built on their desk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the the lab is always hot, and I know we had a period when we were developing a new power module, and that power module is 20 kilowatts. So you had a 20 kilowatt heater going on in the lab for oh quite God. a few hours. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Do you have like specialized ventilation then to try and like cool things down or is it just like you just deal with it? No, you just deal with it. But uh, we also, it's a big factory. So the lab is rather small, but if you go out to the big factory and find some open space and you have a couple of meters up to the roof, mm, it gets yep. easier because the heat rises. Yeah. Oh, so you do, mm. you do manufacturing on site? Yeah. So we manufacture ah. everything here. Nice. So that's kind of nice because when I work on stuff, I can go out and pick up a PCB fresh from the production line. What kind of capabilities does your production line have? You mean uh, how many of one thing we can make? Actually, I meant uh, how sm- like uh, how small can you go if you need to? Okay, no, no. So we're not making like uh, PCB assemblies. We we purchase the, the like the PCBAs from our suppliers. Okay. So here yeah. we assemble the product. So we okay. we have yeah. some metal casing. We put in the the heat sinks and the the boards from like for the primary switching boards, the transformer, the secondary mm-hmm. diodes, uh, some output filter board, and uh, everything is assembled on a line. And then it goes to some uh, module testing. If you look at the modular products, got so, it. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I imagine your test stands are pretty pretty interesting too. Yeah, yeah. So it's uh, that one is like a big hood that goes down over the module automatically to like protect you because it's the first time you power it on. Some things can go bad, so <laughs> yeah. it's good to have safety for your workers. So yeah, yeah, yeah especially in an automated way, right? It's just like yeah. it's just they walk away and it's just doing its own thing. Yeah, so it's a uh, hood goes down over the mod- power module, and then there's some automated testing going on, making sure the output is correct and it uh, uh, following the specs. Yeah, so okay. that's great. Yeah, that's great. Is there like calibration that's required in these kind of devices? Yeah, or? some 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 have some calibrations, and uh, because mm-hmm. we have a quite big range, also, so some of the oldest power modules for the high current side, they they are analog. So you have mm-hmm. some trimmer potentiometers and stuff like that oh, yeah. to, to yeah. adjust. And uh, then you have the, the digital power modules. And um, those also have some kind of calibration in, in the menus of the, of the software. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Switch it out to DAX instead of instead of uh, trimmer pots. Yeah, and, and it's even like that. Uh, like for the latest uh, product we made, we made sure it could self-calibrate itself. So, so the output should be really exact from the power module. There should be no question about it. But we still had to put some calibration menu inside because when it, that one gets to a customer and they have a current uh, meter, they clamp it on and they say, no, it's not showing the correct value. Uh-huh. Right. So right. maybe the, that meter is not calibrated, but they still want it to show the correct value. So they want to be able to adjust. So, Yeah. You know, I, guess, I guess what I was wondering there too is like how much... How much requirement is there for like so if you're pumping two thousand amps into a you know a vat of copper cooper, cooper chloride or whatever is yeah. actually plating, do they care if it's like one amp, point one amp, point oh one amps, you know, like less than that? I don't know. Mm, I'm not so sure, but they still want like uh, point, they want like one percent accuracy, less okay. than one yeah. percent ripple. 
Yeah. So so yeah, one percent on two thousand amps is yeah, sure. tw- twenty amps. Like yeah, mm. yeah. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's t- <laughs> plus or minus twenty amps. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it seems doable, but at the same time, like that's that's a a lot of swing. Like that's just a lot to to get right. You know, like, that's yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and then you all have all these chemists that are making these recipes, and they specify it should be like this. Mm-hmm. And you you could argue that maybe it's not so important. Like it's exactly the like if you have a pulse, it, is it, does it matter if it's exactly a square wave or not? But if right. the recipe says a square wave, they want a square wave. So yeah, just Chemist, de- you know, <laughs> de- de- deal with it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, uh, can you walk us through like a you know like an audio block diagram of what one of these systems looks like? It doesn't have to be like exact to the actual thing but like you yeah. mentioned you know primary secondary transformers things like that like what, what's actually happening internally on one of these boxes so we, we could start like on, on the big stack level because we assemble usually like 10 of them into a stack so on the stack level the, the free phase comes in and you usually have an emc filter to cope with emc requirements so yeah, yeah. Uh, and then it goes uh, the power goes uh, to a 24 volt supply that will supply the, all the control boards with 24 volt uh, voltage. And uh, then it goes down, uh, the free phase goes down to all the power modules. And uh, on the input of the power module, you have a small board for connecting the, the free phase and you have uh, some uh, fuses and, and you have some kind of common mode choke to take care of some EM, EMC requirement as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Then after fuses, you go to a rectifier bridge. Then you come on to the what we call the primary board. And the primary board has the IGBTs that switches the, the rectified voltage. So you also have some cap, uh, but it's not so big on our products, like a DC link cap. Uh, so it's so you like, said you'd said a rectifier, but then also IGBTs to do like active switching is that the idea yes it's primary side switching so you you rectify Mm -hmm. the free phase into like a seven or eight hundred volt dc okay Uh, and then we in this uh, like these high current products we have like a half bridge so you have uh, one high side and one low side uh, igbt okay um, like a push pull kind of uh, topology kind of thing through like a through a transformer yeah, for a transformer. So I think it's called mm-hmm. just half bridge. And you have you have mm-hmm. some uh, two uh, DC caps that has a midpoint. So the midpoint of the transformer on mm-hmm. the primary side is into two caps that's between the plus and the minus on the DC link. So you have half mm-hmm. the voltage over the IGBT. Okay. Uh, if you would have a full bridge, you would have the full voltage. But in this case, you have half the half voltage. So that's the, that's the benefit of maybe of the half bridge. In, but instead, it has the higher current than the full bridge. Yep, got it. Yeah, so that goes into the transformer. Then on the output of the transformer, you have the secondary diodes because now it's uh, switching. So now it's not DC anymore; it's AC, mm-hmm, sort of. Yep. So switching at like uh, thirty-seven kilohertz uh, for that one. And then you have some interesting phenomena also when the diodes are like they are alternating in their conduction. So. When one starts to block, you have the reverse recovery. Uh, basically, oh, you need yeah. to send some cover, some current backwards to, before it blocks. And uh, when it blocks, the yeah the, the resistance basically goes infinite. So the current must go somewhere. So you have a voltage spike. So you need a snubber. Mm, okay. So so there's like an RC snubber on the on the diode taking care of that voltage. Since these are quite big, uh, yeah, I was designs. gonna say I'm like thinking about the like the power to, you know we're talking about here too. Yeah, it's like big, probably voltage spikes. But then if you're just snubbing it, that means it's just burning up as heat, right? Yeah, so maybe, but not so much. Maybe five or ten watts in heat on on the snubber, but still you must cope with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I just mean like I mean relative to like so like p- people were listening right now. They're like, uh, my product doesn't use five or ten watts ever. You know what I mean? Like it's just like just these scale differences are yes, so great. Yeah, it's yeah, about so awesome. just, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, 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 and the voltage spike is uh, on some products uh, so to be like maybe 480 volt on the secondary oh. side. <laughs> wow. So okay. there, are, there are 600 volt diodes there. So. Yeah. Wow. And it's just, is it just a one to one transformer as well? No, transformer is uh, maybe 
30, it's 13 primary in one product it's 13 primary turns and three plus three on the secondary because you have a, a center tap okay yeah and um, and also because of that topology so when you block the voltage with the diode you basically block double the output voltage so for like a 50 volt uh, power module maybe you will have 90 volt out if you have high mains because you want mm -hmm. to have 50 volts even when you have low mains oh right yeah right yeah and that's what you were talking about at the beginning right if it's yeah. uh, if you're in a boat and you have some like higher voltage you have to just kind of design for that margin all the way through your product it sounds like yeah so then you're blocking twice 90 volts so you're blocking 180 volts mm, and wow, then we have yeah. some nasty reverse recoveries depending on the signs and stray inductance and stuff like that yeah yeah and does that get worse because these are bigger diodes as well like the the re recovery and things like that yeah maybe the recovery recovery is a bit worse because of that but also because of the the, like the design itself it's you have one big transformer you have some copper bars going to the diodes you have some copper bar going from the diode to the output inductor mm -hmm. so the, the it's, it's just all copper because it's got to be as low uh, resistance as possible yeah wow. so it's it's a lot of copper bars and uh, yeah yeah <laughs> As a as a side note, I when I worked uh, before I worked at Kraft PowerCon, I worked like with the encryption and telecommunication stuff, so it was all really low power. Then I come yeah. here and my first day yeah. at work, I, I mean that out in the lab with a big wrench connecting cables, and uh, like <laughs> the That's cables great. are like uh, 120 square millimeters, and uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's so awesome. yeah, so so after the. Um, the secondary diodes, you you go to a big inductance to be to because you have a square where you're basically coming out from the yeah from the transformer. Right, you're not you're not like softening edges to lower your EMC or anything like that, mm, right? No, no. So it goes into the inductance, which makes it makes it more into like a sawtooth uh, form from okay. the square away. Yeah, and um, on the way, I think it's after the. You also have a current transfer, current sensor to sense the output current. As it not, a, not a sense resistor at 0.0001 no, no. <laughs> ohms. <laughs> no, you can have shunts, but you need to cool them. Right. <laughs> uh, in this case, it's usually a LEM sensor. Uh, they make whole effect uh, sensors. Okay. So we have both closed loops and open loops. Um, the closed loops are uh, more accurate. And they're a bit yeah. more expensive. Yeah, yeah. I I'd ima I always imagine that with the the current sensors. I always think about them like as like you know like clamp sensors and things like that. You know, they're the coils going around a a, a wire or something like that. Like not not precision at all. And then it must get harder as as you're trying to get more precise. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, yeah, you also have some caps on the output uh, to take yeah. care on some of that ripple. And so that that uh, you mentioned the the sawtooth and the output mm -hmm. is that what you expect to see then? So if you were brave enough to stick a scope on the output, would you see like is it like a, a... You, yeah you see a, a, a like a twenty amp sawtooth before the output capacitors? Mm, okay, so they are taking that uh, current. Uh, so the so caps the caps are handling that that sawtooth yeah, and helping yeah. to smooth it out. Yeah. Huh. So in, in the end, on the output, you, has, you have less than 1%. Uh, so if you have a 300 amp output, you have 3 amps, maybe that's left. Oh my gosh. So how much of this is like, uh, is any of this on a PCB or is this all just like uh, like up on pegs or, or some kind of like uh, individual elements? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, all, it's all on uh, like copper bars and the connections. Uh, Mm -hmm. so like standoffs and, and things yeah, like that yeah copper plates uh, and connecting stuff <laughs> and, uh, wow. and uh, yeah, the primary board has the current going through it but we're only talking about 14 amps in that board right. or in, the, in this current product maybe it's 35 amps of primary sure, current sure. yeah yeah only only 35 amps right right yeah. so low <laughs> Yeah. So then, so then you must have to. So you're then monitoring this stuff using that current sensor, yeah. Um, and you're doing some kind of control then to then like feed that back or what back around the the transformer with isolation or something like that. Yeah, exactly. So we have some isolation going on. 
to uh, and the, but the, the current sensor is isolated by the signs. It's uh, sure, sure, yeah. It it, yeah. it goes around uh, the bar and it has, has no contact, so it's isolated. But we also sure. sense the output voltage. So the the output voltage and the output current uh, is going back to the control board mm-hmm. uh, that sits at the front of the module next to the primary board. Mm-hmm. So it will read that. It will feed it into its PID regulator. And it will yeah. uh, increase or decrease its uh, pulse width depending on that. Wow. So, and, and we run in that case, we run two regulators in parallel: one for voltage and one for current. Okay. And whoever says it wants the smallest wave for, uh, PVM it wins. Okay. So that's how you can cap on both. The customer can set I want uh, twelve volt and two hundred amps, and if it gets two hundred amps, it will stop at that point, even if the voltage is maybe three volt. Mm-hmm. Or maybe it will. The, the resistance is different, so it goes up to ten volts or twelve volts, and regulates on that one. So, mm-hmm. and it can also be that if you know if you remove the if you're doing the plating and you you're putting stuff into the bath and you're removing stuff from the bath, the resistance oh, yeah, changes. Right. So yeah. you need to limit both the current and the voltage. So you have set points for both. Got it. I have to say, like, even though it sounds like a closed loop system, because you are sensing on the you know the mm, secondary mm, side mm, and yeah. feeding it back and it's like it is closed loop but it it almost feels like it's open loop because you're just like well <laughs> <laughs> hope this changes is how we need it to you know it's like i mean yeah. and like what is the propagation time as well from like you know from sensing a change to then getting it back around and actually impacting the the, the difference like do you have a spec on how fast you expect to be able to respond to a change uh, yeah we basically respond uh, in the next uh, pulse so Oh, the, okay. the the switching freq- if the switching frequency is 37 kilohertz, kilohertz you have like 27 microseconds wow. so yeah. you, you sense it and you do some cal- calculations on it and you re- regulate your pvm hmm. um, okay. and so, and and when you said pulse too you mean that like so we have the pwm is it is a mm. continuous pwm going or is it is it are these actually pulses that are happening? No, no, no it's continuous. Yeah. So oh, it is. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Got the, it. so yeah, we re- react yeah. quite rather instant, and. Um, hmm. And so when you do when you do a pulse, like you're talking about, like for the copper bath for like plating those those tiny tiny vias. So is that also driven from the primary side, and you're doing like a pulse at a time? You're like saying, "Hey, we're only going to turn on for this short amount of time, and then turn back off." Yeah, in that case, there's a little bit of extra stuff coming into the picture. Then it's another product, so we base it on the the high current power module. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So the high current power module supplies uh, the the three or three hundred amps, and in that case, I think it's thirty volt. And then it goes into a pulse module, and the pulse module has a lot of capacitors. So it basically (laughs) it stores that energy. Uh, I don't know how many are they are, but uh, yeah, there are, there's a lot of them. And and then there's the H bridge on that pulse module that ac- actually okay, sends yeah. that power out. And the uh, the output of the, of the product is like five volt at maximum, but mm-hmm. the the actual voltage that it's working with is is thirty volt. Mm-hmm. And it, yeah. it's because it needs to create those really sharp edges. If you didn't have that high drive voltage it would wouldn't be a square wave it would be a right. sine wave coming out mm-hmm. and so it just like snaps off when it gets to the point where it need it, like 30 volts so it climbs super fast but then you snap it off using the h bridge or whatever yeah so in that that is a separate regulator that one needs to be really fast you don't get the overshoot and things like mm-hmm. that yeah uh, yeah uh, i was looking into that product uh, just a couple of weeks ago and it, I, I didn't. I was not here when they made that one. They, maybe it's mm-hmm. um, ten years old. It's written in assembly, and it's like, mm-hmm. okay, yeah. uh, we're adding some features here. Uh, let's not touch that part and try to. Yes, <laughs> yeah, it works. Let it be yeah. and see what right, we, else right. we can add. And uh, <laughs> and that one was also interesting because it's like an old processor. I think it's uh, twenty years old or something. And it's wow. like running out of RAM all the time. So it's like, okay, yeah, we, ha- yeah. we have three bytes of RAM now. Okay, we can, <laughs> yeah, okay, let's do something with that. Oh my uh, gosh, a new feature. Yeah, <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah. One thing that's really obvious to me is like, so obviously you've been very open talking about this stuff too, and it's like, mm-hmm. 
so like this kind of industry or like when I was working at Keithley too, and it's like, you know, like people come in and like, yeah, maybe you can work on this stuff, but like there's one, there's expertise in people like you, but two, mm. it's just like, it seems like it's so dependent on material sourcing and like, like tribal knowledge internally of like, like what it takes to get like super sharp edges, like you're talking about, or yeah. build out a supply chain that could you know, actually make this thing happen on a mm. regular basis. Yeah. 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 And, and Kraft Powercon has been around for a while. It's uh, it's founded in 1935, so <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's uh, it's 85 years now, and people have come and come and gone over the years. So yeah, I guess the knowledge stays in the company, and uh, we get new people and we get new ideas, and we continue making the old ones also, mm-hmm. trying to support everything. We can we yeah. can get rectifiers from the Swedish railroad here that was produced maybe 30 or 40 years that they want serviced. Wow! Like they'll come back and they'll come back from them. They come back and they say, can you fix this one? And, and I guess yeah. it's because maybe they don't want to do a new EMC measurement of the train. So mm-hmm. they cannot yeah. exchange it to something new without doing a <laughs> new testing. Right. Like a, a reevaluation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's it, they try to get it fixed. And uh, yeah. uh, there was one uh, fascinating thing also recently. It was one guy who, who purchased a car repair shop and he found yeah. this old battery charger. It said Tudor on it. And the Tudor was the name when the company was founded. So he, somehow he found us and reached out and said, do you know anything about this one? Uh, and I, I went into the archives here and looked around and I actually found some reference to some metal, front metal plate. And it was from uh, 1937. Holy moly. <laughs> <laughs> so it was That's like amazing. A, okay, on the, on the 4th of January, 1937, somebody took up a, out a drawings number for that front <laughs> plate. Yeah. Wow. Uh, and it's been the same for me when i mean did you like at least offer to buy it from him and be like we got to put that in our lobby or something yeah 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 yeah. yeah. They, they are trying to buy it now i think they want to put it in the lobby <laughs> exactly yeah. oh that's so yeah. cool yeah man that is that's crazy that there's i mean like just that that kind of longevity in a tech company you don't you don't hear about that often no no and it's even the the where it, where the company was uh, before because it's a mode from one city to another um mm-hmm. uh, or some what's it called suburbs of the Gothenburg. Oh yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So there was a fire and in the factory and they moved to a new place. So some of these documents have survived that fire. So the, this one was a bit, uh, you can see that it has been wet at some point. Uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. And the, the history is fascinating. Like uh, when I, I made a couple of PCBs here and you go and make, take a new PCB number, if you scroll back in that, uh, paper you can see pcb numbers that were taken out before you were born (laughs) (laughs) wow so like okay this company has been around for a while and then now i'm I'm... i mean like was did the company have access to pcb houses earlier than others maybe too because they were supplying them with copper plating capabilities so they just Mm -hmm. like were tied into that (laughs) supply chain i'm not sure i know that we made stuff ourselves here at least we assembled the pcbs we had our own assembly line Mm-hmm. But yeah. uh, later we sold that one to a company that became our supplier, <laughs> mm-hmm. so yeah. kind of outsourced it. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, that happens. I mean, like, and especially like if usually that always seems to happen when it's like, well, do we want to update from you know we can't get through whole parts like we used to, but you know do mm-hmm. we want to update to an SMT assembly line? It's like, nah, we'll just push that off, and then you know someone wants to buy the old assembly line or whatever too. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. that's uh, yeah, that's crazy. Wow. <laughs> uh, so, so the boards, I mean, so like, like I said, the supply chain, mm-hmm. I mean, it seems like you guys really, you're making a specialized product. You're, you have specialized knowledge about all this stuff. You had emailed me about all this stuff because it was actually when I was t- started talking about Zephyr. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you would send me an email that said Zephyr without the RTOS part. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, <laughs> exactly. Because you've so, been talking about Zephyr on, on the on mm-hmm. the amp hour, so I got inspired uh, mm-hmm. by that one. So what do you mean by that, though, without the RTOS part? Yeah, because you were talking about the hardware abstraction. And and um, mm-hmm. uh, right now I'm working as a software team leader here at Kraft PowerCon and mm-hmm. trying to make the, the, the software part uh, a lot more modern and modular and flexible. Because mm-hmm. it's a company that everything was analog, and then somebody invented microcontrollers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 
And then the double E started writing code and everything went downhill from there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> the double E started writing code and they got some kind of ID from the from the vendor <laughs> because it was easy, not a lot of tools to install. You That's know? right. Yeah, and yep. they write some... Uh, so they're using lot... pick parts, is that what you're saying? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they were writing code and then they discovered they need to make another product. So they copied that code to another That's product. That's right, yeah, yeah. And they even didn't even have like version control. Yeah. Maybe it's not it wasn't wasn't invented yet. I don't know. But at yeah. the beginning, all the code was on the on the server. So you can see mm -hmm. actually they had some rule that if you add a line, you will add a comment about which version you added that line in. So mm -hmm. it's like all over the code. You see dash dash uh, version one point two, <laughs> dash dash version <laughs> one point four <laughs> for every line. So instead of like a, a useful content, it, yeah, useful uh, comment. It's just it's just the version stuff. Huh? Yeah, there were useful comments, but there were also like the version ones. At least it was a try. Yeah. So so the, then when I started working here, and the, first I did some hardware stuff and PCBs, but now I'm working more with software, and we're facing like we have forty different firmwares that we try to maintain. And a lot of them oh are gosh. just copies of copies of each other. So if you find yeah. a bug in one, you might need to fix that one in three, yeah. four, five other ones. Uh, you you had to go and put dash dash three point two or <laughs> dash yeah. dash three point seven, right? <laughs> yeah. No, at least it was in SVN uh, when mm -hmm. I started here. Mm -hmm. So subversion, but uh, now I'm moving things to like uh, Git and uh, Azure DevOps and uh, trying mm -hmm. to make a continuous integration pipeline and uh, all that oh, stuff. Nice. I just, I'm just imagining people listening right now and they're like 40, 40 straight minutes of talking about like hardware and like, you know, oh, high power. Yeah, this is awesome. And then <laughs> boom, 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 firmware. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah that's it's, great. A, it's an important aspect. And I think it's a really yeah. good part of the amp power that you go into electronics, but you also go into the firmware part. Yeah. Well, yeah. So we, I mean, like it feels like it's on a void. I mean, like, so obviously you guys are making analog stuff, right? Yeah. And that's a very viable product line. But these days, I just imagine that if you wanted to add new features, you would be doing it with a microcontroller or with, you know, some UI element or some other thing on there. I mean, is that has that been a tough cultural shift internally? Mm, yeah. No, not so tough to shift to that, but maybe tough to see the value. Uh, okay. People are starting yeah. to see the value in software now. Mm, Maybe you, you can offer them not a display that displays current and voltage. You can offer them a display that's fit to your process. You can say, I want uh, five micrometers of uh, copper, or I want right. uh, this amount of hypochlorite for my uh, ballast water treatment. So you can, you can tailor the display and the GUI to the process to provide value that way. I think that's one important. And the other important thing that you, software brings is the ability to push out fixes. So yeah, if some customer right. has a problem with the regulator, oh, you need to change the P or I or D constants of the regulator on the old one, you had to send a guy out to solder some uh, resist resistors. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Now they can do it through the menus. Uh -huh. And there has been a couple of cases where, okay, we discovered a problem and then it's like, uh, we need a hardware fix. Can you do something on software in the meantime? And then I come up with a fix that uh, mm -hmm, mitigates yeah. the problem until we can push, uh, exchange some boards or something. Mm -hmm. Just to like yep. always try to help the customer in the fastest way possible. Yeah, I mean, I mean, like lying down situations are just so detrimental to production. Yeah. I can imagine that they you would get very angry phone calls if something's not working as they, yeah, yeah, they needed exactly, to. Exactly. Yeah. So, as, so the, as the product flora, it grows, we get more and more products and it gets harder and harder to maintain them. So mm -hmm. that's where I thought about, okay, we should really make this modular. If we have like a CAN bus implementation, why not have the same in all products? Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's not currently you're saying? You're, no. It's, it's right now, it's, there's individual They're individuals. They're like copies of each other and they're also individual implementations. Uh, so try to make it more modular, easier to maintain. And, and and when you make stuff modular, you start thinking about the API between them, the, mm -hmm, the interfaces. Yeah. How, how how can I abstract the interface of this module to work with uh, any other module that I want to connect it to? Yeah, the API is just the uh, the the connector of the uh, yeah the, the uh, software world. Yeah, <laughs> which pin is which? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So uh, recently, we, I think it was this spring, we hired a new software guy called uh, CSIS, and he uh, had worked with uh, Autosar in the automotive industry. Mm -hmm. So he had some background in like modular design, and we were thinking about that. And uh, but uh, people start 
shivering or something like that when you mention Autosar. It's not the nicest experience for some people, I guess. What what is it called again? Uh, Autosar. Autosar. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's a framework for automotive. Okay. All right. Yeah. So I guess I'd have to, I'll look that up. Yeah. 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 And, um, but uh, I have heard Zephyr mentioned a couple of times on the amp hour. So I started looking into it. It's like, it looked really good. It has really good hardware abstraction. And, and we said to each other, well, why don't we make it like, like that? And, uh, and I think it was like the day after that, I listened to the amp hour and you and uh, they were talking about it. And uh, mm. I was like, yeah, yeah. Uh, we are trying because we we said that if we make our modules in uh, with the Zephyr abstraction, we cannot reuse them if we start to use Zephyr also. Mm. So it's like, yeah, we have something to follow and we don't invent it from, take something that works. Instead, if you try to invent it, you have to iterate over it to get it working. Here right. we have a reference. You can just implement like that reference. Right, yeah. So, the, even, yeah, so you're just re-implementing like a API layer and you're not yeah. going to, so you were saying you're not necessarily going to use the whole the whole framework, you're not going to use everything from it because I think you said it was specifically because of timing requirements. Is that right? Yeah, it's like uh, some of the products are they are set up in a specific way. So you have like um, it's uh, it's done with interrupts right now. So maybe you have a mm-hmm. uh, one kilohertz interrupt, a hundred hertz interrupt, and a ten hertz interrupt, and they do different mm-hmm. things. And there's yeah. some priority maybe to the faster one, the slower one do some communication stuff. And even in the in the power module, you have the 37 kilohertz interrupt. That's really important. That must mm-hmm. always be served. So yeah. if you're going to put it in R to us, uh, I don't see the immediate benefit for us. Maybe mm-hmm. we can get it to work. But if we don't need it, why, why go for it? Yeah, yeah. Mm, at the same time, I, I'm a bit uh, tempted because it provides a really good hardware layer also. Sure, sure. But yeah, so this seems like this is like a, this is one of those scenarios where like you have to hit your timing, right? Like, so that 37 kilohertz over the 27 yeah, microseconds, yeah, whatever, yeah. like you cannot miss that, that train as, no, it, no, as it goes no, by the station. No. Right? Things and, will go boom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's, that's bad. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah so we were so, just looking into like now we're implementing like uh, something called Profibus, which is a field uh-huh. bus used in industry. Yeah. They have a lot of buses in industry. So that that one uh, will talk to a um, uh, specific ASIC, Profibus ASIC on SPI. Mm-hmm. So yep. as we make this uh, Profibus module, the SPI calls that it will do will be uh, Zephyr compatible. Mm, so we we'll make it. make our SPI driver that way also. So we could just take that Profibus uh, module into Zephyr and it would work right off oh, the bat. Nice. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, and so like if if you push that code upstream, then someone else could pull that down at some point and and use that to talk to that same chip. You're saying, yeah, exactly for Zephyr. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. So that's why I think it's yeah, it seemed really a really good choice because we've also been thinking about R two OS maybe for not the power modules, but on the stack level, you have a controller that's talking to the display, co- yeah. talking out to the PLC. And mm-hmm. uh, as I was listening to the embedder, they discussed about uh, where to use an RTOS and they had some good arguments for like whenever you have uh, communication, I think they said, uh, Alicia yeah. and uh, Chris. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 That, I think that's, that's, a, that's a good guideline. I mean, and, and so how does that work like internally then? So, so do you have, so you have a processor, like you're, you're a real-time processor, your thing that's handling that 27 microsecond must hit deadline for the, for the switching. Yeah. Is that like a standalone thing? And then that has a, an interface to, to the controller, like you mentioned, or, or what is like, how many processors are in the system? Yeah, there's, uh, there's one on each power module and that, that one okay. has its 37 kilohertz and the, and it's getting its set points from the, the the stack controller and it sends it down either analog in some products, so it's sampled mm-hmm. by an ADC, or it sends mm-hmm. it down by CAN bus. And, uh, and that value might be stored in like a global variable. So when the 37 kilohertz interrupt fires off, it has the latest value in some global variable that it will just mm-hmm. read. So I think a lot of information between the interrupts are exchanged through global variables. Mm, got it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was just wondering, like, uh, so you mentioned not wanting to use an RTOS because of that. And then I was just thinking, like, 
sometimes when there's like something that's so timing critical, you could put a processor just doing that one thing and making sure that it's always hitting that. But then it could have another interface that's going out to like, you know, like, like you're like, like the, it sounds like the architecture like you're doing and that, that could maybe do an RTOS or whatever you needed because yeah. it's doing communications. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been thinking in, in the terms of that because mm -hmm. you have this TI uh, line of processors where they have some real time units on them. Mm -hmm. uh, they have some different cores just to do some uh, really critical tasks. Oh, like the, uh, like the PRUs? Like the, yeah, like the PRUs. The... Yeah, I was thinking yeah. about the PRUs and just like, mm -hmm. oh, maybe I could use the PRUs to do the switching of the IGBTs and then I can use run Linux or something on the other one. It's not so critical. Mm, yeah. 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 Or yeah. Uh, or like when uh, Jay was on the show, he was talking about that uh the STM32 MP1 I think it is, and it's got like a Cortex M4 on board that just does the the real-time stuff. Yeah, actually so. I have a board with MP1 here oh, and also oh, nice. <laughs> How do you like it? Yeah. Yeah, I haven't played so much with it, but uh okay, okay. Uh, TBD, TBD. TBD, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. You get a lot of stuff that you want to do and you not always yeah. have time for them, but oh, sure, uh, sure. in that case we thought about it because we have an STM32 F4 on the stack controller that that's uh, uh -huh. responsible for talking to the power modules. Uh -huh. So if you choose if you switch that one to an MP1, you could basically transfer all the code directly mm. into the F4 part of the MP1. And yeah. then you can use the rest of the MP1 for the display and the connectivity and uh, other fancy stuff. Yeah. Uh, where right. you could use, like, I believe it's really useful to use Linux uh, mm -hmm. on those parts because it's, uh, you have a lot of connectivity for free in this. So, yeah. Right. Right. And, and then you don't have to worry about the, the real time aspect. Which no, is, it's, it's handling itself. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. That, how, how, do you, how do you analyze all this stuff? I mean, how, how do you. I mean, obviously, you're. <laughs> if it doesn't go boom, it's good. Uh, but, but like, how are you watching all the cycles and testing this stuff on the bench and and like making sure that you're hitting your your timing? Yeah, you put your oscilloscope on the things and you measure it. Like you, you must measure like the dead time between the switch pulses because if mm -hmm. they're on at the same time, they will go boom. So <laughs> you, you you can set uh, put some dead time into the PVMs blocks of the STM32. Mm -hmm. And then you measure and put out maximum PVM and you you can have a current sensor on it, but you can also put the oscilloscope directly on the IGBTs with some high voltage probes mm -hmm. and some uh, isolation transformer on the on the oscilloscope itself or you have isolated mm -hmm. isolated probes. You, you mean you don't want to like uh, chassis ground the whole thing? <laughs> no, no, not <laughs> through, really. Through the scope probe? Yeah, I've done that one. <laughs> it's like I've seen both. You have the isolated probes. Uh, that's good. But if some if you don't have that probes, you can put your like high voltage probes, but you need to make sure you're not touching the BNC connectors on the scope. Yeah. If they're connected to the 700 volt DC line of the power module. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a good way to good way to waste an oscilloscope. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so you need to measure that one, and then like uh, there are some overcurrent protections. You need to verify that that one works. So yeah, uh, create a shortcut. Yeah, I, I guess that's what I'm wondering about. Is like like you're setting up guardrails for yourself. It seems like you know making sure that A, B, C, and D don't happen. Yeah. But then how do you how do you validate that? And it sounds yeah, like yeah. you, you yeah. have the test set up for that. You test it up and you start on a low voltage. So the voltage, <laughs> okay. the voltage we have in the lab, you can just turn uh -huh. it down. To maybe you start at uh, 24 volt AC and you go up as you as you Got see it, it, yeah. it's working. Yeah. yeah. But uh, me personally, sometimes when there's some new stuff I must test and I know everything should work. It's you faster. It. Yeah, it's faster. Just go for it. Either it works or it blows up, and then you start on the on the lower voltage. But if you start on the lower voltage and do all the verification when you don't need it, it, it takes more time. So uh, it it yeah. depends. Got time, you know. I got I've got more I've got more uh, stock than I've got time. <laughs> yeah, but of course on a, on a new product you start on that one. But when you have a working product and you need to change something, I sometimes I put on the hearing protection and the protection glasses and uh, and I go for it. Oh, I'm just imagining like like you have like a rare pair tech out on the floor and yeah. like like oh Frederick's doing some testing. You just like you're just walking out and dropping <laughs> like smoking boxes on their desk <laughs> over and over again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's great. I mean, the it it seems like the testing is like a really critical part of all this. But like, yeah, do you have 
any kind of like automation in in that realm? I mean, you talked about like doing some continuous integration stuff. Like, are you working towards the like the bench testing side of things as well? Like automation on that side of things? Yeah. So if you if you look into software, uh, we're doing looking to doing more and more like unit testing for all the modules because if you make all this mm-hmm. hardware abstraction you can unit test very easily all the mm-hmm. modules you have a nice uh, abstraction layer and then you go down to the lower levels at some point you need drivers for the hardware and then you, we're looking into making more like hardware bo- I do make hardware boards with all the different uh, mm. like I have a DAC on one product so I have a module for that DAC I could just uh-huh. make a test board with that tech on it so I can download the, the firmware uh, like nightly builds and, and test them. Got and, it. And then and have that like, go into some like a DMM or something like that that's like yeah. tracking it. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. Uh, yeah, since but since we have production, we also have a lot of automated tested in production. So yeah, like uh, for our PCBs, we are setting up test jigs that do automated testing or depending on the volume, if it's a low volume board, it's many manual and the when it goes to high volume, it becomes becomes uh, automated. Mm-hmm, yeah. That testing is done by, by our supplier, so we are like developing develop, developing a test stand and send it to them. So they oh, run it. Okay, when so they like run. oh, the CM, you mean like they'll have that as part of their like acceptance testing? Yeah. Mm. Uh, so the boards when they come here, they should work, and we are Got monitoring it. that and making sure we're not having too high, a uh, too low yield. Like then you mm-hmm. need okay, then you need to think about should we. Uh, we should probably add another test because something it's yeah. missed by the test. So if you can make all the boards that's not working, getting stuck at the CM, they will take care of their process because they want yeah. high yield. So yep, yep. And so what are the, what are the actual outputs like? So like so one of the modules that you might be testing at the CM using a test board that would have like a like a not like a DAC output, but would actually have like maybe like the the pulse output that's driving the IGBT is that kind of the thought there? Yeah, yeah. So like, if you look at the primer board, the the CM, they 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 have like a a, me, a mini variant of the of the power module. They have a twenty four volt AC input to that board, and it's mm-hmm. switching, and and then we're measuring and making sure it, everything works, that the pulses are correct, and uh, like that. So then it gets verified uh, at, the, at okay. that part. Then the board comes here, it gets assembled into a power module, and then the power module goes into a module tester here that's automated. Ah, and, okay. Yeah. And, and, and then the power module gets assembled into a stack, and then that stack goes to the final testing, which is also an uh, automated test, uh, but with personal, because you need to connect a lot of cables and uh, yeah, w- right. cooling water, because you have both water-cooled and air-cooled. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it, the final test should just uh, pass without problems because yeah, each individual piece is good. Right? Yeah, 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 and we can yeah. see them as the customer. This is how it should work at the customer. So it should mm-hmm. be no faults at the final testing. Yeah, but uh, mm-hmm. you need and we run it for like an hour or so to make sure it heats up and it works. Like, mm-hmm. I guess you test drive a car when you manufacture it. <laughs> That's also. right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. So uh, you've mentioned the stack a couple times too. Is that just mm-hmm. to like get parallel? versions of the same board doing like the same amount of current is that the thought there yeah yeah that's the power of the modular design so mm-hmm. we, we put a lot of modules in a stack and the stack can be configured as parallel output or a serial output mm, okay and that's how you can yeah yeah for that. example the, the marine products they often use a bit higher voltage so they have 50 volt modules but you can connect four outputs in series to get 200 volt. Mm. And then you can, so if each module has two outputs, so on its own, it can do 100 volts. And then you take it in series in another module to get 200. Mm. And then you can make uh, five of those groups in a stack uh, in parallel. So you have 200 volts and uh, 100 amps, and you do five of those configurations in parallel, so you get 500 amps. So Mm. 200 volts, 500 amps, it's uh, 100 kilowatts. Wow. And then, uh, so then is the transformer in each case of those, is the transformer on the actual power module itself? Is that, is, or is there like some larger transformer? No, no there's one in each, uh, actually two in uh, each, since okay. they have two outputs. So the power stage, so one power module is 10 kilowatt in that case, and each power mm-hmm. stage is five kilowatt. And then Got you connect a, le- a lot of them. So 
uh, that's also one thing we identified when you made we made a, a product recently that we made into 20 kilowatt because it was like okay what are the, the customer requirements what are the stage what are the steps they would require because mm-hmm. if you make the power stage too small you make a lot of measurements uh, you make a lot of transformers a lot of current sensors a lot of voltage mm-hmm. sensors yeah. which ad- adds yeah. cost to the product so the less uh, control logic because the essence of the product is to deliver power. So in that case, 20 kilowatt was a good fit, but mm. it has, yeah. So it depends how flexible you want to be regarding or versus the cost of the production. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the, the, the trade-off in modular design is like how atomic do you want the unit to be? It's like, you could have every, you could say like, oh, well, I'm going to use just like breakout boards for every single chip on the board. And then everything is super modular and it's like, okay, that works. But then you have, in that example, you know, the added cost of interconnects and extra PCBs and everything else, you might get benefit from being able to switch out every chip, but then the overhead to do so is like really, really high. So it's like, where do you, where do you kind of draw the boxes around, around these systems? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and also then, then it becomes quite interesting when you have a lot of these power modules uh, connected in a stack and you want to regulate the, the output current or the output voltage. Mm-hmm. So, because if you put them in parallel, they will all see the same voltage, uh, the, the common voltage yeah, on, right. on the output. But you still want to regulate it, and you want to, you want them to be able to supply uh, the same amount of current. Mm-hmm. Because if one module puts out fifty volt, uh, and the other module sees that, and it's like, oh, it's fifty volt on the output, so my PVM is zero, then then every, everything right. is fine. <laughs> Right, right. So, so they need to like be aware of like where they are in the stack as well. Then is that the kind of the thought? Yeah, yeah. They need to be aware of where they are to know if they are in series because mm-hmm. whether you need to figure out the configuration. So mm-hmm. the you you configure it in the menu, and then you need to like okay, if it's series connection with two modules, then every other module is in is a slave to the one above, uh, yep. and things like that. So. There's a lot of stuff going into that and then going into like current sharing when you're in parallel. Right, right. Yeah. You don't want one to be doing, you know, 100 amps. The other one's doing 5 amps or something, right? Yeah. And when, when you're in in series, instead, everybody sees the same uh, current. So you must make sure that they actually supply the voltage they are supposed to supply. Uh, mm. Because the current will go, fr- the current from the module before will go through the module after it. And yeah, it's the same current in the loop uh, when you're mm. in series. So so then how, do, how does that play back then in the software realm then? So like you're saying you want to modularize everything on the software side. Mm. Does that mean that like you also have to push that stuff all the way back up this the system yeah there's some stuff going on like uh, have like a current share master for example that's looking at uh, maybe one module has that role and it's looking mm-hmm. at okay when when i'm outputting uh, 50 50 volt and uh, the current is 100 amp okay let's tell everybody to run 100 amps so in that case one module is running in voltage control and the other ones are running in current uh. control uh-huh. Uh, so there's a, like a PID in that one to make sure they slowly ramp up to the correct current to get 50 volt on the output, for example. Uh-huh. And when you're serious, there are like different ways you can solve it. You can, uh, one module can see, okay, I run, when I get this current, I have this voltage. So I can tell the other modules to run this voltage. And you must make sure the whole system doesn't oscillate and uh, things like that. So Oh, right, right, yeah. Yeah, because I imagine some of these loads are very interesting, like in capacitive or inductive kind of, uh, probably capacitive mostly, right? If they're big tanks. Yeah, tanks, yeah. They're quite resistive and there's some problem when the material goes in and out of the bath. Oh yeah, right. And then in the in the high voltage, just two big metal plates. So they are very capacitive. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. And then you have sometimes long cables, which adds inductance and uh, yeah. Mm, yeah. Yeah, so that plays plays havoc with your PID loops, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. <laughs> well, that's uh, yeah. This is a uh, this is quite an interesting field. I I I wouldn't have guessed that like you know like you you say like switch mode power supplies and it's like yeah. oh okay that I I think I understand that. But then like the just the range of like how this is being put to use, it's like it's really quite crazy. It's big you know, stuff. Like like if you look at the final test area, there's like big copper bars in the ceiling going to the load. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. It's like I ran one test with like uh, two or three stacks of power modules and it was like 12,000 amps of output current. Mm -hmm. So it's like, yeah, there's a lot of power (laughs) (laughs) controlled by software. So yeah, 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 yeah. that's what's yeah. That's also kind of crazy about it too. You know, like just just oh okay, one bit one bit's wrong, and yeah. well, like you said, goes boom. <laughs> yeah, so you need to to put a lot of care into that, and uh, yeah, yeah. Well, Frederick, what else should we know about this uh, this field? I mean, it seems very interesting. I mean, are you guys? Uh, well, are you hiring? Are you uh, are you looking for more people? Uh, yeah, at least on the I know that on the software side, we are looking for more people because mm-hmm. we are. Uh, we are three people now, and as I said, it's like 30 or 40 different firmwares and the yeah, people yeah. starting to realize the value of good mm-hmm. software. So, yeah, yeah, I haven't got to go ahead to recruit, but we are looking for interesting candidates. If the right uh, resume happens to find its way across your desk, you're not yeah, going to yeah. say no, yeah, no, right? You might no. push it up the ladder, you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah usually <laughs> when you get a really good candidate, you usually can get an exception. That's or, right. Yeah. Oh, look, look, a position just opened up. Who, yeah. who knew? How did this who happen? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And uh, yeah, I would really like to get uh, more competence in the area of regulation loops and stuff like that. So if uh, anybody is yeah. really good in, in that area. Yeah. Okay. All right. Mm-hmm. So like, uh, like PID control yeah, and stuff like yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, mm, yeah. Okay. And, and we're starting to doing more like active PFCs and then you have like six RGBTs that you're going to control with uh, mm. with software to get that PFC running. And yeah. It's a, power factor control, you mean? Yeah. Like exactly. PFC? Yeah. 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 So like you're not, uh, so like when you are in a, you're not like making your grid go go sideways. Is no, like an idea? Exactly. And and it can actually increase the efficiency of the products so you can have a mm. higher efficiency. Yeah. Well that's great. I mean that's I think that is the, the the right way forward. I mean like that you can really start to have finer and finer control of like these really big things, but it's like you can you can uh you can get a lot more out of it it seems like. Yeah, I must say I listened to episode uh, five twenty inductance and stuff, and you mm-hmm. you starting talking about the the compute module four again a little bit. Oh yeah, so, yeah. And that one you also mentioned on on the on the episode that I was listening to about uh, Zephyr. Uh, mm-hmm. I think it was uh, yeah episode five fourteen. Yeah. 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 So um, we're looking into that as well to le- like add a. a compute module to control our displays and so yeah. it was quite fascinating i was listening to you talked about Zephyr, and then i went to work and we started discussing how should we control this display oh there's <laughs> something new called a compute module 4 and then on the way home <laughs> I, I listened to the last part of the episode and you guys started talking about it and uh, yeah maybe, maybe we're just listening to you here you know, yeah, it's, I mean, it goes both ways at that thing. Maybe it's, that, it's, in, yeah. it's the uh, zeitgeist of, of the electronic scene it seems like <laughs> yeah so you on the last episode i listened to uh, the 520 you talked about uh, routing the like the differential pairs for the H- hdmi oh, and yeah, stuff yeah 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 so uh, that was quite interesting and uh, i i listened to rick hartley thanks to you also he has a really good YouTube video about what your differential pairs wish you knew. Mm, okay, I, I actually, yeah, I don't know if I've seen no. that. Rick no. Hartley's the the signal integrity guy, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And uh, apparently, there were some guys at John Deere that had tested this because apparently they do this stuff in, tra- in farming equipment also. Okay. So it was quite fascinating to listen to that one, and uh, mm. yeah, I think you can. Uh, on, on a HDMI signal, you can skew it by three millimeters. But one example was like a 100 megahertz signal. You can mm-hmm. skew it plus minus 55 millimeters. <laughs> and, and, and it will still work. So, wow. Yeah. Okay. So, not always that critical. Also, like, yeah. I think Jay Carlson talked about. Yeah, that's kind of what Jay Carlson was talking about. Yeah, right, yeah, right, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. That's so, great. Yes. You know, that's good to know. Like, even though, you know, like having a little margin. Yeah. In the uh, proverbial, uh, you know, Digital signals not going boom. Uh, no, no. <laughs> that's good to know, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's great. Yeah. Well, uh, Frederick, thank you for being. Thanks for listening to the show, and thank you for writing in and, and being on the show. This is like super yeah, yeah, interesting, yeah. and it sounds like you're doing some really cool stuff there. Yeah, so yeah. I hope people reach out to you. Where can where can they find you if they're if they're interested in maybe pushing a resume across your desk? Or just yeah, then high? they should find me on LinkedIn. In that case, I guess. Okay. Uh, otherwise, I'm mostly on Facebook. So yeah. It's, there's only one Frederick Sander in the world that I know about. So yeah, you okay. should probably All find right. me. Okay. 
Well, thank you, Frederick. It's been great having you here. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's been a great, uh, great to be on the show, and uh, I'm a big fan of the show, so it's really yeah. fun. Thanks. All right, we'll talk to you soon. Yeah, talk to you. Bye. Talking about high power stuff today, we realize nothing makes us feel more powerful than having the backing of our audience on these shows. Join the other patrons keeping and getting current each week via patreon.com slash theampower. A special thanks today to our corporate sponsor, Vino.